Most of you who know me know I'm a dermatologist and I do telemedicine around the state. And within the last month, I've seen with my residents and cared for a gentleman in one of the most underserved areas of our state. And for the clinicians in the audience, he has dermatitis herpetiformis. And for the non-clinicians, he has a disabling, intensely itchy, blistering skin disease that requires him to eat a special diet um, free of something called gluten, kind of like a protein. And I was talking to him over telemedicine, and I was asking him about his diet, and I was recommending he go see the dietitian there in the community health center, make an appointment, and learn about a gluten-free diet. And he's about 55 years old, and I said, now, maybe your wife should go with you. I said, you know, who does most of the cooking in your house? And without missing a beat, he looked at, he looked at me, and he said, well, honestly, Burger King. <laughs> and he wasn't joking. He said, you know, my wife and I both work two jobs to make ends meet, and Burger King, we eat most of our meals at Burger King. So I'll just um, <laughs> stop with that and introduce Dr. Margot Wutan. Uh, Dr. Wutan is with the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Um, it is a consumer advocacy organization. It specializes in food, nutrition, and public health. Um, she actually founded the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, and she's led efforts to require trans fat labeling on packaged foods by 2006. Uh, Dr. Wutan is a national leader in the effort to improve school foods and require calorie labeling, et cetera. And she, just before coming here, she was with the Missouri School Board Association at the lake. And maybe she'll talk a little bit about how that experience went. Um, she earned her Doctorate of Science in Nutrition from Harvard University School of Public Health. And I think we're in for a real treat um, to hear her today. So thank you, Dr. Wutan, for being with us. Well, good afternoon. I hope you'll uh, continue to enjoy your lunch while I talk about this, and hopefully I can get through the restaurant part quickly, while, and we won't talk about the chocolate cake um, number of calories. I think I have carrot cake for an example, so you're in the clear. Um, but it's really terrific to be here. Um, my mother actually reminded me as I was driving down to the lake, um, I called my mom and chatted with her on the cell phone to occupy myself for a couple of hours. and. Um, she said that my family is actually from Missouri, that her grandparents um, came from St. Genevieve. And so if any of you have the last name Braun, maybe we're related. Um, but before they went down to Oklahoma, she said um, our family was originally from here. So I didn't know that. So I have some Missouri roots, which I didn't know about, um, which is nice to hear. Um, I'm going to talk today about a few ways to address obesity and nutrition. And um, I think the most important thing to think about when you're thinking about these issues is to help, is to understand that people are living in a food environment that makes it really tough for them to eat well and to watch their weight. That when you have a situation where two-thirds of Americans are either overweight or obese, we know that this is a societal problem. This isn't just a couple of people struggling. This is all of us, you know, really struggling to try to eat well and watch our weight. And while some experts are scratching their heads wondering, you know, why are obesity rates increasing, I think all you have to do is look around to see why, that in this junk food, couch potato culture, that the odds are really stacked against people who want to do the right thing, who want to feed their kids a healthy diet, who want to eat a healthy diet themselves, that we've actually gotten to this situation where healthy eating is like swimming upstream, you know, where it's much easier to eat badly, to eat too many calories than it is to eat, um, eat well. So that's not to say that personal responsibility isn't essential to... Um, to this issue, but it alone is not enough. That, you know, certainly willpower hasn't declined over the last 30 years as obesity rates have gone up. And, and parents don't love their children any less than parents did in 1970. That we need to think about this environment that people live in and begin to address it in ways to support people in their efforts to eat well, to make it possible for them to eat well themselves and to feed their children healthfully. So let's just think a little bit about this environment. 
First, there are messages. We're bombarded with messages about what to eat. And those messages don't come from health professionals. They don't come mostly from doctors and nurses and dietitians. Those messages mostly come through marketing um, by the food industry. And unfortunately, the mix of marketing that people are exposed to is mostly encouraging them to eat high calorie, low nutrition foods. If you look at just advertising by food manufacturers, only 2% of the ads are for healthy foods like fruits and vegetables and grains and beans combined. All the rest of the ads are for mostly convenience foods, candy, snack foods, sugary drinks, and other foods that most of us should be eating less of. Also, everywhere we go, we can eat. You know, it used to be that gas stations mostly sold gas. Now they're convenience stores. Um, I know my Best Buy that's, um, that's in my neighborhood, you know, as you're walking out to buy your CDs and computer supplies, you can also buy chips and candy and lots of other junk food as you're going out. I recently found out that drug stores actually now sell more food than they sell drugs. That, you know, it just seems there are meetings at work where you get, you know, even if it's healthy foods, it's like a 400-calorie bagel and a 200-calorie juice and plus the cream cheese. And so at 10 o'clock, when you shouldn't even be eating, you're eating, you know, an extra six or 700 calories. Um, that there's just all these food outlets at shopping malls, there's fast food restaurants on every corner, there are vending machines, that we just, we're never more than, you know, a stone's throw away from food. And so there's all these messages encouraging us to eat, and then there are all these opportunities to eat, and unfortunately often to eat the wrong kinds of foods, or more of the foods that we should be eating less of. You know, it's not like we're always close to apples and grapes. Also, we're eating out a lot more than in the past, and I'm actually going to talk about that quite a bit. So I'm going to skip right over to portion sizes, which are big, getting bigger and bigger. This is almost not an exaggeration anymore, the sizes of foods that we're being served when we go out to eat. Also, when we go to restaurants, the food is priced in a way that makes those big portions almost irresistible. You know, for just a few pennies more, you can upgrade from the small to the medium or the medium to the large. So you almost feel like an idiot to go into 7-Eleven and get the small soda when for just 37 more cents, you can upgrade to the double gulp, you know, which I can only hold with two hands. It's so heavy. Um, and no longer fits in the cup holders of cars. Um, but the way that food is priced creates an incentive for people to, um, to upgrade to bigger sizes. Um, if you go from the small popcorn to the medium popcorn, it's an extra 500 calories for just a little more money. That's 900 calories in just that medium bag of popcorn, and that's the popcorn without the butter. Um, that if you go up to the large, you're talking 1,600 calories or so. Value marketing has been very profitable for food companies because the actual cost paid to the farmer, the food cost, is such a modest fraction of the final cost of the product itself. Most of the cost of the food that, you know, what you pay for the food is for labor, packaging, transportation, um, rent, you know, the overhead cost. So when you upgrade from the small fry to the large fry, the company makes a lot more money because the potatoes don't really cost them very much. And their marketing, transportation, all the other costs don't change. So companies have found value marketing to be very profitable. When you pay more for bigger portions, they make more money. Another problem that we face is liquid calories. We are drinking a lot more calories in the past. You know, water is um, it's popular, you know, bottled water, but there's a lot more sugary drinks that people are drinking. And so people are drinking all these calories from soda pop, from juice drinks, um, iced teas, lemonade, um, sports drinks like Gatorade, and they're not even thinking of them as food. So you go into a restaurant like, say, a TGI Friday's, Applebee's type of restaurant, and they serve you a 400-calorie drink. And then they give you free refills. You know, that people are drinking as many calories with their meal as they probably should be eating for the whole meal. I'm not going to talk much today about the physical activity side, um, but just to keep in mind, you know, we're facing similar problems on the physical activity side. We have all these wonderful 
conveniences and labor-saving devices that are a part of our life. But unfortunately, they also engineer physical activity out of our life. And I'm not going to advocate that um, you give up your washing machine or your dishwasher, because I know I'm not giving up mine. Um, but we need to keep in mind that just to live life in America today just doesn't take as many calories as it used to. Also, our communities are designed for driving, not for walking. Oftentimes, the way communities are designed, we live here, and everywhere we want to go is over there, miles away, so we have to drive to get there. Our transportation policy focuses a lot more on making the streets safe for driving and not making the streets safe for walking and biking, which um, could provide people with opportunities to be physically active. During the school day, Kids are not having as much opportunity to be physically active. There's not as much physical education as kids need. And also kids are being driven to school, mostly in private cars or in school buses, and very few kids are walking. So, you know, if you pictured schools back even, you know, 20, 30 years ago when I was a kid, um, a lot of us walked, and there were, you know, some kids who took the bus. Now in front of my daughter's school, there's this big congestion of minivans with all the parents dropping their kids off, even though we all live in my neighborhood, you know, which is in the city, um, we all live within a mile of the school. Also, we watch a lot of TV about three to four hours a day. Not only is this a sedentary activity, but while we're watching, we're exposed to a lot of advertising that encourages us to eat, and we sit there and eat while we're watching. So we just need a change in thinking about these issues. We need to recognize that the food environment has a big impact on people's ability to exercise personal responsibility and to make healthy food choices. Again, it's not to say that personal responsibility and personal choice aren't central to these issues, but we need to keep in mind the context in which people are making these choices. So let's talk about a few places where this is um, particularly of concern. And I have to say right from the get-go, there are a lot of influences on people's eating habits and their activity levels. And we can't deal with all of them all at once. What we've done is look at the literature, look at trends in eating habits, and picked out just a few things that we think will make a big impact that are important places to start. So I'm going to talk to you about three or four policy options today. Um, once we get done with these, we're going to have to work on other things, but we think that these are good places to start given their impact on people's eating habits right now and the potential for um, helping to turn things around. So the first place I'd like to talk about is schools, just because that's where our kids are for most of their waking hours, five days a week. And schools are already in the business of feeding kids. We're not talking about adding any new burden, any new responsibility to schools. We're just talking about changing the way schools are already feeding kids. So schools already have the school lunch and breakfast programs. We need to make improvements there. Schools already have vending machines, a la carte, school stores, parties, food rewards, lots of different ways that they're feeding kids. So we're talking about changing the way kids are fed at school, not adding some new responsibility to schools. So with school foods, they're really broken out into two groups just because of the way that they're regulated. There are the foods that are sold through the nationally regulated, reimbursed school lunch and breakfast programs, and then there's everything else. And that's just, they're regulated differently, so that's the way I'm going to talk about them, because um, when it comes to policy, you need to deal with them differently. Over the last 10 years or so, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has had a school meals initiative, and they've been working very hard to try to improve the nutritional quality of the foods that are offered through the school lunch and breakfast program. And they've actually been doing a pretty good job. Not that we don't still have work to do, but there have been some significant improvements to the nutritional quality of school lunches and school breakfasts. Over the last 10 years or so, the nutritional quality at school meals have improved in a few ways. The amount of saturated and trans fat well, actually, we haven't measured trans fat. The amount of saturated fat and total fat has decreased. The amount of sodium and cholesterol has gone down. 
the amount of fruits and vegetables have increased. And if you look at your average school lunch or breakfast, it's actually a pretty decent meal nutritionally. It provides the key um, nutrients that are required, protein and some key vitamins and minerals, in the amounts that are required, and it provides different, it provides a required amount of servings from the key food groups. So overall, school meals are balanced, and the fat and salt and cholesterol is coming down. But we still have some work to do that still only about 15% of schools meet the saturated fat guidelines for school meals. And we need to continue to work to improve the appeal of the meal so that there's not stigma surrounding these meals and that kids want to eat them. It's not enough to just serve fruits and vegetables. We need to make sure that, they, that the kids will eat them and that they don't just go in the garbage. There's a very important opportunity right now for improving, continuing to improve the school meals. The school lunch and breakfast programs are required by law to be consistent with the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is the basis for all national nutrition policy. Not only is it the federal um, nutrition guidance and the basis of all federal policy, but also most states use the national dietary guidelines for Americans as the basis for state policy as well. So, we have looked very carefully at the dietary guidelines for Americans and the current nutrition standards for the school meal programs, and we think a number of changes are going to need to be made. Um, USDA is going to need to have more fruits and vegetables in school lunch and breakfast. Actually, they're going to need to increase fruits and vegetables by about a whole serving. They're going to need to make half the grains whole grains, because right now most, a lot of the grains that are being served are refined grains, which aren't as healthful as whole grains. They also need to set some quantitative limits for sodium to make all the milk that's served with the school meals low fat either 1% or fat-free. Milk is a good source of calcium, but it's also the number one source of saturated fat in children's diets, which puts them on the road to higher risk for heart disease later in life. So just switching to low-fat milk is a real easy, no-cost way to help reduce heart disease risk among children. They'll need to set limits for added sugars and trans fat, and they also need to change the calorie requirements to better balance concerns about food insecurity with concerns about childhood obesity. We need to make sure that hungry kids get the energy they need without overfeeding kids who are already eating too many calories, and I think there's some work they need to do in order to find a better balance between those two things. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture is in the process of updating the nutrition standards for school meals. Um, initially, those proposed regulations were supposed to be out in January. It now looks like it's going to be a little later than that. Um, we are keeping a close eye on this process. I encourage you to do so as well. And we need to make sure that USDA not only comes up with strong standards, but that they do it in a timely way. And then once those standards are in place, we need to work to help schools to meet those standards and provide healthy meals that kids will eat and enjoy. Now, while there's been um, improvements in the school meal programs, um, the foods that are sold outside of meals are, there have been improvements in some school districts and not in others, in some states not in others. I think we have a little bit more of a mixed, um, mixed um, we have some mixed results in this area. There are a lot of foods that are sold outside of meals, out of vending machines, a la carte in the cafeteria, school stores, fundraisers, and other venues. And I don't know if you guys know about a la carte, if you don't have kids that are in schools, and you might not be familiar with it, because we didn't have it that much when I was a kid, but um, the kids can buy a, re a reimbursable meal in the cafeteria, or they can buy the food a la carte. <clears throat> and with a la carte, they can just mix and match the different foods that are sold and put together their own meal. So they don't have to pick the vegetable. They don't have to get milk. So a kid can just buy French fries and a Gatorade and make that lunch. They can buy little Debbie snack cakes and, you know, some chicken nuggets and make that lunch. So a la carte is actually a big problem in a lot of schools. 
if you look at the foods that are being served out of these venues, there's a lot of unhealthy foods. Um, we did a study of school vending machines a couple of years ago, and we found that 85% of the snack choices and 75% of the beverage choices were foods of poor nutritional quality. So you can look at the very tip here, and we only found that 0.1% um, of the slots had a fruit or a vegetable in them in high school and middle school vending machines. Most of the slots are filled with sugary drinks like soda pop, fruit drinks, and sports drinks. There's a lot of candy, chips, cookies, snack cakes, and other low nutrition foods in the vending machines. Snack foods and soft drinks are problem parts of kids' diets. One thing is, is they can displace healthier foods from the diet. So when a child eats chips for a snack, not only are they eating something that's low in nutrition, but they're not eating apples or pears or baby carrots. You know, so they're missing an opportunity for healthy food. Or when a child drinks a soft drink, they're missing an opportunity to drink low-fat milk, which can help to prevent osteoporosis. Soft drinks still cause a lot of dental cavities and tooth erosion, which is a concern. And studies show that kids who drink more soft drinks consume more calories and are more likely to be overweight. And that link between soft drink consumption and obesity is getting stronger and stronger. And I think now even the soft drink industry is recognizing that soft drinks don't belong in schools anymore. So there's a lot of activity on the school foods front, as you probably know. Um, at the local level, a lot of big school districts have changed their policies to get rid of soda and to set nutrition standards for the snack foods. It's you know happening in Los Angeles, the District of Columbia, Philadelphia, New York City, and a lot of other large school districts. But also, Congress passed a law in 2004 that requires every school district that participates in the school meal programs to set nutrition and physical activity wellness policies. School districts are supposed to bring together key groups in their community from parents and school board members and administrators and school food service personnel um, and others in the community to develop these policies and implement them. And I think that sparked a lot of activity at the local level around school foods as well as around physical activity in schools. To help schools meet this requirement, we worked with about 50 other organizations from around the country to develop model nutrition and physical activity wellness policies that address a wide range of issues, recess, PE, walking to school, um, school lunch, school breakfast, vending, school parties, rewards, and those model policies are on our website, on this website at schoolwellnesspolicies.org. Also, um, CSBI has a school foods toolkit, which has a lot of information about not only what kinds of policies to implement, but also tips for working in a local school district or with a state legislature on this issue. In addition to local action, there's been a lot happening at the state level. Just last year, you just saw where Missouri was? Um, just last year in 2005, 400 pieces of legislation were introduced, or I'm sorry, 200 pieces of legislation were introduced in 40 states to improve the nutritional quality of school foods, mostly dealing with vending and other foods sold outside of meals. <coughs> you can see a number of states have implemented strong policies, Kentucky, um, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, California, and others. But still, the overwhelming majority of states, including Missouri, have either no policy or have a very weak policy. That we have a patchwork of state policies addressing school foods. Um, what Missouri does is rely on the national standards, which I'll talk about in just a minute, which are very weak and out of date and not something that you want to be using in your own state. Um, let me just talk first before I get to what that policy is, talk about um, recently 
the soft drink industry, along with the Clinton Foundation and the American Heart Association, announced some voluntary guidelines for addressing soft drinks in schools. And I think what's most important about this voluntary agreement is that finally the soft drink industry has admitted that soft drinks and most sugary drinks do not belong in schools. That this is something parents and policymakers and health professionals have been saying for about a decade. And finally the soft drink industry has come around and I think that's a very important step forward. The guidelines that the industry has agreed to are strong for elementary and middle schools. <clears throat> for high schools, they're not as strong. They still would allow sugary juice drinks and sports drinks to be sold in high schools. And those beverages, um, while they're marketed as healthful, are really nutritionally equivalent to soda pop. That sports drinks, you know, have been marketed in a way that, you know, a lot of school Officials think that, you know, if a child just walks from one building to another on a hot day, they need electrolyte replacement. That, you know, after PE, you have to have a sports drink. But, you know, what the, what the experts say is that sports drinks are useful, useful, not necessary, for people who are exercising very vigorously for more than an hour. And they're useful in terms of enhancing performance. Not that people are going to drop dead from, you know, sodium deficiency. Um, our kids are eating plenty of sodium already, and basically sports drinks are just sugar water with some added salt. So um, when you're thinking about beverage policies for a local school or for a state, keep in mind that while some states are continuing to allow sports drinks to be sold, this is really not based in the best science. That sports drinks maybe should be offered for the track team after school, but a kid who just, uh, you know, has done 40 minutes of PE certainly doesn't need a Gatorade in order to um, replenish their electrolytes. Also, with fruit drinks, fruit drinks are marketed as fruit juice. They have a lot of pictures of fruit on them. They have very fruit-sounding names, um, but they're really just sugar water with a tablespoon or two of added juice and are nutritionally no better for children than soda pop. So these, this policy in high schools is really flawed. Also, this is about the third iteration of a beverage of the beverage industry coming up with voluntary guidelines for soft drinks in schools. We didn't see much happen from the last two iterations of that. Um, hopefully this will be better because the Clinton Foundation and the American Heart Association are involved. But schools don't have to follow these guidelines. Schools are not a party to this agreement, and it remains to be seen whether or if schools are going to go along with these standards or not. And others, like the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, have better standards for school beverages, which I would encourage schools to use or states to use as the basis of their policy rather than what Coke and Pepsi came up with. So what we're advocating is that there should be um, an update of USDA's nutrition standards for all the foods that are sold outside of meals. Now, I know some of you are probably very supportive of local control in education, and I respect that. Um, but school foods are different than other aspects of education policy. School foods have long been a national issue dating back to the time when Harry Truman helped to start the school lunch program. So school lunch and school breakfast, school foods in general, are regulated at the national level by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Congress, down to tiny little details of, you know, how big a serving of fruit or vegetable should be served with a meal, what kinds of proteins count as, you know, as the meat, dish, that um, school foods have long been a national issue, and the state and local folks are responsible for implementation, not for setting policy. USDA does have national policy on foods sold outside of meals, out of vending machines, a la carte, school stores, and other venues, but those standards are getting quite old. They were developed back in the 1970s. They are out of sync with current science. They pretty much only deal with sugar, because that was a concern in the 70s. The concern was about dental cavities. They don't deal with current pressing nutrition concerns of children today. They don't deal with portion sizes, calories, 
saturated fat, trans fat, sodium, and other key concerns. The state is relying, Missouri is relying on these standards, and they're not good. Um, they're not good science. They're not based on current concerns of children today, current concerns about children's health today, and they're not based on the best science. So I would encourage you to either support having USDA update the nutrition standards. And I passed around a petition on a couple of clipboards. If you haven't got gotten it or if it's stalled somewhere, keep those going around. Um, one of the things we're asking for your support in is to encourage Congress to allow USDA to update the nutrition standards for food sold outside of meals. The other way you could deal with it is at the state level, Missouri could set its own standards. That right now, as I said, the state is relying on these out-of-date old standards from USDA and they're, it's just not good policy anymore. Um, now, one of the main reasons why there is a lot of soda and junk food sold out of school vending machines and a la carte in school stores is because schools need money. That schools are facing budget gaps, and Coke and Pepsi and snack food manufacturers are stepping in and offering to help schools bridge those budget gaps by allowing the school by having the schools allow those companies to not only sell their products in schools, but also to market their products in schools. Most of these contracts are exclusive beverage contracts, and they include marketing provisions, which are as central to the contracts as the sales provisions. But there are a lot of myths about how much money schools are raising by selling soda and junk food in schools. First, it's not as much money as you think, and actually, um, there's a mistake on this slide. Um, these contracts, on average, raise about $18 per student per year. It's, it's not really that much money. There are other ways to raise that kind of money. The other thing is, is there's a question of whether it's new money. It's not that these, the vending machines are bringing in an extra $18 a year for each student. It's that kids basically are coming to school with lunch money, and they either spend that lunch money in the cafeteria on a balanced meal, or they spend it buying Ho-Ho's and a Coke out of the vending machine. And what's happening is the money is shifting from the food service account to a flexible account that the principals or school superintendents like. So, you know, while schools are raising money by having vending machines, they're losing just as much or more money from the kids not buying lunch. And so there are a number of examples of this. And when schools set nutrition standards for the food sold outside of meals, they're finding that the revenue that they're bringing in doesn't decrease. And actually, CDC and the U.S. Department of Agriculture did a study of 17 schools that strengthened their nutrition standards for food sold outside of meals. And they found that most schools either increased revenue or had no change in revenue. And the one school that lost money actually after a year increased revenue. So it looks like schools can make just as much money by selling healthy foods. Because not only do the kids buy them, but also then they get the extra reimbursement from USDA through the school lunch program. Also, let's keep in mind that Coke and Pepsi are not giving money to schools through these vending contracts. They're actually taking money from schools. The money that goes into school vending machines comes out of the pockets of children and ultimately, I guess, their parents. And it's, even, it's not even the most efficient fundraiser because Coke and Pepsi take two-thirds of the money back to corporate headquarters. So for every dollar that a child puts into the vending machine, schools are only keeping on average about 33 cents. If schools sell wrapping paper or candles or do other kinds of fundraisers, usually schools get to keep about 50 percent of the money. So there are more efficient fundraisers. So I think we need to rethink this whole issue of money and how much money schools are actually raising. So um, I, I'm sure there's a lot already going on in Missouri around the school foods issue at the local level. You might also want to think about what needs to be done at the state level since Missouri's relying on these out-of-date national standards. I also hope that many of you will sign the petition that's going around and support the national um, bill that Senator Harkin and Senator Murkowski are co-sponsoring, the Child Nutrition Promotion and School Lunch Protection Act. Right now, we don't have any Missouri um, legislators 
we don't have any Missouri members of Congress co-sponsoring that bill, even though we have about 50 co-sponsors, ranging from very conservative Republicans to very liberal Democrats. This is a very um, cross-cutting bipartisan issue, and it would be terrific to get your congressional delegation behind it. So let me move on to another issue. And I think most of you are done eating. Good. This is good timing. So we're going to talk about restaurant foods and eating out a bit. Um, another place where people's diets are often undermined is at restaurants, that people are eating out a lot more than in the past. One problem is that the portion sizes at restaurants are very big. And oftentimes, people are eating a lot more calories than they think. So just the entree at a typical restaurant usually has at least 1,000 calories. So a plate of French toast, a plate of spaghetti with meatballs um, typically have about 1,000 calories. If you add in a side dish or an appetizer or a dessert, it's very easy to eat a whole day's worth of calories when eating just one meal at a restaurant. So um, Slice a carrot cake at the Cheesecake Factory. Certainly nobody thinks of it as a health food, but actually just that one dessert has about three quarters of a day's calories. Or an order of cheese fries. Again, nobody's thinking when they sit down to a plate of cheese fries that they're um, eating a health food, but who would guess it's a day and a half's worth of calories? Even if you split that thing with, you know, three or four other people, you're still going to end up eating a lot more calories than you probably can afford. Another thing is, is that it's difficult to tell the difference between different options on the menu. That, you know, sometimes you know that a food isn't as healthful. Like, you know the French fries aren't as healthful as the vegetable of the day, but most people probably don't realize that the French fries actually have about 10 times more calories than a side of broccoli or some sautéed zucchini or whatever the vegetable is. At Starbucks, coffee ranges from about 160 calories, which is pretty reasonable in a latte, to almost 800 calories in some of these frappuccinos that they have. You know, so a lot of people walk into a coffee shop and get a pastry and a coffee, and they think they're just having a little snack, and they're eating a half a day's worth of calories and probably, you know, a couple of days' worth of saturated and trans fat. Another example, you go into an ice cream shop, and again, not saying that anybody is mistaking ice cream as a health food, but your ice cream could have anywhere from about 120 calories to over 1,200 calories at a place like Haagen-Dazs. And this mint chip dazzler, it's, you know, it's about this big. You, you kind of defies a reason, like how can they actually pack 1,200 calories into just that one cup? But um, there are a range of options available, but it can be difficult to tell the difference between them. Eating out is important because people are eating out a lot more in the past. When I was a kid, it was a big deal to pile all, you know, ten of my brothers and sisters into the van and go out to eat. You know, it's not just that we had a big family, but then eating out was a special occasion. Now, as a mom, it's a Tuesday night, I'm tired, I don't feel like cooking, you know, we just pick up some takeout and bring it home. Now, on average, Americans are eating about a third of their calories from restaurants. So it's a big part of our diet. We're eating out about twice as much as we did in the 1970s. And it's, um, it's a growing part of our diet, and it's a big part of our diet. So the choices that we make at restaurants really matter. Also, studies show that when people eat out, they don't eat as well. Eating out is associated with obesity. People who eat out more often eat more calories and are more likely to be overweight. Also, when people eat out, they eat more saturated fat, and they eat fewer nutrients like calcium and fiber, fewer fruits and vegetables. So if you look at people's diets at home, they're better than people's diets when they eat out. And they're better significantly. That when you eat out, these big portion sizes can not only blow your diet for the day, but they can blow your whole diet for the week. That women who eat out about five meals a week, and don't just think about going out to dinner, think about Starbucks and coffee shops, about getting a pretzel at the shopping mall, getting a Cinnabon at the airport, think about eating lunch out. So five, eat, five times eating out a week leads to women, on average, eating about 300 more calories each day, averaged out over the course of the week, compared to women who eat out less often. That's enough to lead to significant weight gain over time. 
So right now what we have is a voluntary system of labeling. La food labeling is required on packaged foods in the supermarket, but restaurants were exempt really for political reasons. It was hard enough to pass the nutrition labeling law in 1990. But um, the current system that we have for voluntary labeling at restaurants isn't working and is not sufficient given how much people are eating out. Right now, even if you look at the biggest chain restaurants, half of them don't provide a single shred of nutrition information to any of their customers. And the other half that do provide information usually provide it on a website, which means that people have to log on to the Internet, have access to their computer before they go out, which just isn't practical. Or McDonald's is really boasting about how now they have nutrition information on the packages. You know, they're going to put the nutrition information right on the hamburger wrapper or on the french fries. But people don't get that information until after they order. <laughs> so... You can think maybe McDonald's didn't think of that, and then maybe they did. Maybe, you know, they did. So um, right now, most restaurants don't have nutrition information, and the ones that do seem to provide it in the most inconvenient way possible so that you can't possibly find it. So instead of hiding nutrition information on websites, we are advocating for local, state, or national policies to put the information right on the menu or the menu board where people can see it and use it when they're actually making a decision. This is totally practical and feasible. Half the chains already have it on a website, so the other half could do that. And then they can just take those numbers and put it on the menu where people can see it. Um, we have been working on policies in Congress. Um, in states, about 15 states have introduced legislation to require nutrition information on menus. Just at fast food and other chain restaurants where they have standardized menus and standardized recipes, where it would be more practical than for a little mom-and-pop diner on the corner where it would be much more difficult for them because they don't have standardized menus and recipes. Um, the states doing this, the states that have introduced legislation include Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Maine, um, and a bunch of other states. And then also a number of cities have been looking at this. So this is something you could do in your own city. Um, New York City, the District of Columbia, and Philadelphia are, have introduced policies. None of these policies have passed yet, but they're working their way through the legislative process. And I think we'll see some pass in the next couple of here. So if you're supportive of menu labeling, that's also on the petition that I circulated, and I hope that you'll sign it. We're looking to get um, more co-sponsors for the national bill that would require menu labeling at fast food and chain restaurants. For those of you who aren't sure whether you support menu labeling or not, we have a number of background materials. We have model legislation. We have talking points. We have um, some answers to some of the questions that the restaurant industry raises when these kinds of policies are introduced. And we have a report called Anyone's Guess, which has information on why restaurant foods are important to Americans' diets and health, how it impacts what they eat, and how these policies can be helpful. So I'm going to just talk about one last policy, um, and that's food marketing to children. And we know that food marketing has a big influence on children's eating habits. Um, there's a lot of marketing. It's very aggressive. It's very sophisticated. And we know that it works. If it didn't work, companies wouldn't spend $10 billion a year on marketing. They have their own market research that shows that marketing to kids works. Also, studies show that food marketing affects children's food preferences, their food choices, and what they ask their parents to purchase. And if you're not familiar with the literature and are interested, the Institute of Medicine at the National academies just did a very comprehensive review of the evidence on food marketing to kids. And um, there's a link to that study on our website. Also, we parents can tell you that food marketing works. I know every Sunday when I go to the grocery store, I have a little more evidence that food marketing works when my daughter begs me for the Disney Princess cereal or for um, other foods that have her favorite characters on them. That parents know that marketing not only influences what foods their kids ask for, but what foods their kids expect to be fed. That the diet that is marketed to children 
as what they expect to be fed is very different from the diet that's recommended by health experts. And there's this huge disconnect between what we tell our children is healthful to eat, what physicians and dietitians tell parents they should be feeding their children, and what marketing markets as desirable to eat. And marketing almost makes us parents out to be liars. You know, we're telling our kids they should eat chicken and fruits and vegetables. And then the diet they see marketed to them is pizza, hamburgers, chicken nuggets, and other low-nutrition foods. So it really has a profound effect on how kids think about food and what food they're willing to eat, what food they expect to be fed. Now, I'm not against food marketing. I actually understand the power of marketing. That's what makes me nervous. The problem with food marketing is that overwhelmingly, almost exclusively, the foods that are marketed to kids are of poor nutritional quality. They're not broccoli and bananas and other healthful foods. They're sugary cereals, snack foods, candy, soft drinks, fast food, and other low nutrition foods. And these foods are marketed very aggressively. Shrek, SpongeBob, games, contests, prizes are all used to get kids to ask their parents to buy low nutrition foods. There's not only television advertising, but there's also a lot of magazines that are designed just for children. There are also snack brand books, which can turn reading to a child into an opportunity to market low nutrition foods. And you know, this marketing is so brilliant that we buy these ads and we bring them home. And you know, we're paying for these ads and then we, you know, read them to our kids. We don't even think of them as advertising. Other ads that we parents buy are toys like um, pretend food from Pizza Hut or Dairy Queen or these little um, figurines of the Kellogg mascots. There's also cell phone advertising, which is growing, and more and more kids have cell phones. There's also advert games on the internet. And these games are really fun, and companies build in their products, their logos, and other marketing information to interactive games that children can play. So instead of sitting and passively watching an ad for 30 seconds on television, um, kids can sit at the computer and play an ad for 30 minutes and interact with the brand. There's also a lot of advertising and marketing at schools. There's products and company logos on school signs, on book jackets. You know, the companies actually provide book covers to the kids. So you can turn the child's math book into a Juicy Fruit ad or a Gatorade ad for the whole year. And with school vending machines, not only do these dispense unhealthy foods, but they're like little billboards in the hallway that children pass every day. So there are a number of ways to address food marketing to kids. We have primarily been focusing on encouraging companies to do the right thing. Some of that encouragement is very gentle and private. You know, we have conversations and meetings and discussions with companies encouraging them to be more responsible in the way they market food to kids. And so we've developed a set of guidelines for responsible food marketing to children. And we've had some very good interactions with Kraft, with the Disney Company, with Sesame Street Workshop, and a number of other food companies and entertainment companies which are changing their marketing practices aimed at children. Other companies need a little more nudging or encouraging, and so sometimes we'll send out a press release about a bad ad campaign and try to get some publicity to put public pressure on the company. Still others need more nudging, and we've used the courts and asked the courts to step in and get the companies to stop marketing food to stop marketing junk food to kids. And while as a nutrition professional, I'm reluctant to sue anybody, um, this has turned out to be a very powerful means of persuading companies to change their policies. And um, we filed a notice of intent to sue Kellogg and Nickelodeon in Massachusetts. And already Kellogg is coming around and is probably going to do this on their own. And we won't need the courts to step in. 
also we have been asking congress over the last several years to increase funding for the centers for disease control and for state health departments to fund campaigns to promote healthy eating and physical activity to balance out the messages that children and their parents see encouraging them to eat unhealthy foods and so we've had some good success in increasing funding at CDC for nutrition and physical activity promotion programs. Now CDC is able to fund 28 states for nutrition, physical activity, and obesity, including Missouri. So the funding that the Missouri State Health Department has for nutrition, physical activity, and obesity comes from this pot of money that we've been lobbying Congress for. Um, the amount of money Missouri gets is pretty modest, and so we're continuing to work to increase the amount of money so that every state can be funded Funded and that states can be funded at a higher level. Um, we're also working on some legislation to address food marketing to kids. And at the state level, one thing states can do is to limit junk food marketing in schools. For more information about food marketing to kids, we have this report, Pestering Parents, which is available on our website. We also have information about the policies I talked about today, as well as other policies, on our website at cspinet.org slash nutrition policy. And there are background reports, fact sheets, talking points, model letters, um, model policies, um, information about what other states and cities are doing, and a host of other resources, some of which we've developed ourselves and also links to what other people have pulled together. And then finally, we have um, a website for children that teaches them about some of the influences on their on their eating habits, including eating out and food marketing, at um, smartmouth.org. So overall, we're, we are working on nutrition education and strengthening nutrition education for parents and for children through the Centers for Disease Control, through state health departments, through the Teen Nutrition Program, but. Just as importantly, we're also looking at policies and environmental changes that can help to support parents in their efforts to feed their children a healthy diet and to eat well themselves. You know, even I know as a parent, even though I'm very committed to healthy eating, my daughter's at school for most of the day um, during the week, and so what she gets fed in the classroom, in the cafeteria, at her aftercare program, all have a big influence on what she eats throughout the day. And she's got a lot of junk food that I would rather she not eat, but that I really don't have that much control about. And I know even being a full-time nutrition professional public health person, it's hard to work with the schools to get these changes that, um, that we need to help parents and support them in their efforts to feed their children a healthy diet. At schools, we need to reduce the junk food marketing. We need to make sure there are calories on the menu board so that people can see what they're getting and be able to make informed choices. And again, it's not to say that parents aren't ultimately responsible for what they feed their children or that we as individuals aren't personal, personally responsible for the choices that we make, but we need to recognize all these outside influences on people's eating habits and find some ways to make it easier. I would say even make it possible for them to do what they already want to do, help them to eat well and to watch their weight. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. Dr. Fleming. Yeah. The question is, is there a concern about loss of fluoridation because of the use of bottled water? And I think there is some concern um, between bottled water and filters in the home. And we are seeing some beverage companies adding fluoride to the water, especially for children. So a lot of these small bottles of water have fluoride. But I, I do think we need to think about policies, both um, in terms of public health and education and with health professionals, about how to adapt to the change in how people drink water. Take one more question.
what um, the question is about what parents are bringing and the nutritional quality, what parents are packing in their children's lunches. And um, most state policies and local wellness policies are starting by trying to improve what the school sells and offers, because that's what parents don't have control over and don't always know what the nutritional quality is of the meals themselves and don't know what snacks and other food the kids are being offered through the day. And so to support parents, most have agreed that the place to start is with what the school sells, offers, and provides to children. But a lot of policies, including our model wellness policies, also um, have ideas for how to educate parents, not to require or set limits for what they are allowed to bring to school, but to provide education to parents and encouragement to parents um, and tips for parents about healthy foods to pack in their lunch. So I think most of the policies that have been set deal with setting nutrition standards for the foods that the schools provide and then providing education and encouragement for parents to pack healthier foods. I think we're just about out of time, so we're going to take a about a 10-minute break, and then we'll meet back in the next room. Let's give another round of applause for Dr. Rutan.